going to ask you to do is if you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Pastor Chris told me that you've been working through the book of Acts since October. Uh, it's only 26 chapters, and he is determined to take 26 years to get through it, from what I can tell. Uh, and so, because he was in Acts 2 when I was here in December. Uh, he preached Acts 2, we're just in Acts 4, and we're only just a couple months out of that. Uh, and so I asked him, I said, do you, want me to, uh, do you want me to fall in line with that? And he said you were in Acts 4. I read, so I'm about to tell him, I'm not much better. Because I got like four verses in, and I already had what I was going to preach on. So you've got the whole rest of the chapter. Maybe you've already started it. But I, four verses into the, the chapter, and what I recognized was this, is that the most empowering kingdom reality that we hold to is addressed in those first four verses. Because I know you're talking about kingdom realities in the book of Acts and how they empower the church. So if you read with me Acts 4, 1 through 4, it says, While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000. Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus that your word will go forth and accomplish everything you will and desire it to. Father, it says, God, in Isaiah, that it, it, will, it will not return void. And so, Lord, I'm thankful today that there is a harvest of righteousness that's being reaped in this place. Lord, as the word of God goes forth, in Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. amen. So, uh, this is, a, I'm going to make you a promise if you make me a promise. Ready? I promise not to preach long. <laughs> I'm serious. But you got to promise to listen the whole time I'm preaching. Okay? No, I'm being serious. So if I promise not to preach long, I need you to promise that I'm going to pay attention and not nod off, not drift off, not think about pot roast or if you're going to beat the Baptist to the, to the Mexican restaurant. You need to not. Any, you're going to focus for the next 30 minutes on this message. Okay? That's all I ask of you. So I'll preach short. You don't know what that's like because Pastor Chris is your pastor. But you're going to experience it today. Uh, and so you're going to feel what this feels like. Amen. Amen. Right. The most empowering kingdom reality that we hold to as believers is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. It is the most powerful reality that we hold to. The Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians defined the good news that he preached as embodying three things. Christ's death, his burial, and the resurrection. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4, it says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. See, I love the Apostle Paul. He preaches like I do. He goes, I'm going to just get right to the point. This is what the good news is. And he goes on. He says, Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. That's the good news. It's not complicated. Jesus came, he died, he was buried, and he was raised from the dead. From there, the apostle Paul uses the entire rest of chapter 15 in Corinthians to defend and define the importance of the resurrection. Now listen, this, it's not intended in any way to diminish the Jesus' atoning work on the cross. How many know that Jesus' work on the cross was insignificant and important? Amen. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So we're not trying to take anything away from what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. But what we learn, nevertheless... Death and burial define all of humanity. What set Jesus apart was not his death on the cross. In fact, Jesus shared that distinction with other people. 
If you read Matthew 27 and 38, it says two criminals or revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. So it wasn't like that was, that, that didn't really set Jesus apart. If you looked up on the hill, yes, you saw Jesus, but there were two other men that were being crucified that day. Likewise, being buried didn't really set Jesus apart. In fact, he was buried, according to Matthew 27, 59 through 60, he was buried in a tomb that had been carved out for someone else. Look at this passage. Joseph took the body, he wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth, he placed it in his own, his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock, then he rolled a great stone across the entrance, and he left. So it wasn't even his tomb. In fact, if, we, uh, if you go out, you know, grave sites, are, there's, there's a lots of them. You know, as a minister of the gospel, I've done 15 times as many funerals as I've done weddings. I've been to the, I, I drive by grave, graveyards in Gibson County, and there is no graveyard that I haven't buried somebody in. Because that, it's just commonplace. So Jesus' death on the cross didn't really, it wasn't, it wasn't distinctive to him. Neither was burial. His death and burial, although they were extremely significant, they didn't really cause much of a stir. Neither Jesus' death nor his resurrection really stirred the people up. However, three days later when he came out of the tomb, everything changed. His death and burial were extremely significant to our salvation. Was not the part, if you think about this, when Jesus preached about his upcoming death, people didn't get too bent out of shape. Whenever he talked about he was going to die and he was going to be buried, that didn't create much stir in, in the people. The part of Jesus' message that created the angst among the religious leaders of his day it was his continuous reference to the resurrection. Right? right? They, you could talk about crucifixion all day. That, that were a dime a dozen. They saw him on the hill outside of Jerusalem all the time. They saw people being carried out to the graveyard all the time. But when he started talking about dead people coming out of the tomb, all of a sudden the religious people were like, eh, something, I don't like this message. Matthew 27, 62, beginning there, it says, The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. I love this. They told him, Sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. Listen, they may not have liked his message, but they remembered his message. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. And Pilate replied, take guards and secure it the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. The scripture tells us they sealed the tomb and they posted guards. Now, you know, because, listen, because they were worried that the disciples might come and steal the body. But I want you to listen what they asked for. They said, we want you to post guards and we want you to seal the tomb. See, they were worried more than just the disciples stealing the body. If you're worried about somebody stealing the body, you post guards. But if you're worried about whoever's inside coming out, you seal the tomb. You see the difference? You see, if they were just worried about it, about him coming out of the grave, if they were worried about the dead man coming out, they would have just, they, would, they wouldn't have just, uh, if they were worried about the dead man coming, they would have sealed the tomb. But they, they, that's all they, they, but that's not what they did. They said, we need to do both because they were worried. And listen why they were worried. Because this is why they were, if he comes out, if we go to the tomb and he's not there, we'll be worse off than we were when he was here preaching prior to that. Jesus' resurrection changes everything. 
The cross, it's powerful. The atoning work, his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins, you cannot deny the power in that. That's why we celebrate Good Friday because of what he's done. His burial is a powerful moment as we identify with his death. But his resurrection is what defines us as believers. It is different. You see, the story of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection would be a terrible story if it did not have the resurrection in it. Right? Would that not be a terrible story? The Savior of the world came and died, and we buried him. The end. That's a terrible, there's no good news. You see, the good, that's just news. That's just, that's just, a, Jesus came and he died and he was buried. That's called an obituary. That's not called good news. You see, good, the only way it becomes good news is if Jesus comes out of the tomb. All of a sudden now, the resurrection changes everything. Even after the resurrection, the priests and the Sadducees continued to be disturbed by the message of the resurrection. Yeah. Remember, we just read this in Acts 4. Acts 4 happened after Jesus died. He was buried. He was resurrected. He ascended into heaven. You, all, you know this because Pastor Chris has been preaching on it for six and a half months. Yeah. Right? Amen. First few I'm just going to bust his chops just a little more, and then I'll be done. <laughs> Listen, it, it, took me, it took me like... Two, like a year and a half to preach all of Revelation to our church. So listen, uh, I say that, but I did the same thing. <laughs> Acts 4.2, these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is resurrection of the dead. They went as far. Listen, this is how much they disliked this message. You want to preach Christ's death on the cross? Preach it. You want to you wanna preach that he was buried in a borrowed tomb? Have at it. You want to preach about resurrection? We're going to arrest you and we're going to put you in jail because that part of the message disturbs us. Can I tell you this? And, and, and think about it for just a bit, little bit. The very message that we are gathering in a week's time to celebrate is the same message the disciples were arrested for proclaiming. I mean, I'm telling you the truth. The exact message, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, why we're gathering next Sunday in church is to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and that very message that every the pastor around the world is going to be proclaiming is the very same message that the disciples in Acts 4 got put in jail for. I wonder if we all had the anticipation that that was going to happen to us, how full churches would be next Sunday. Or how many pastors would actually preach the resurrection next Sunday if they knew that that message would disturb so many people and they may be arrested for it. Why were they so disturbed? Because the resurrection defines us. You see, no other religion worships a risen Savior. No, can I say it again? No other religion worships a risen Savior. We're it. It is, it is faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that expressly and uniquely defines us as believers. To deny the resurrection is to deny Christ. That's the short and simple of it. To deny the resurrection is to deny Christ. In Paul's defense of the resurrection, he makes some significant observations that I'm going to leave you with today. That doesn't mean I'm almost done, but it means that I'm getting closer. <laughs> because I promise, I made a promise. How many are still listening? Come on, you still listening? You promise if I pro preach short, you'll listen. Number one, his resurrection was witnessed by over 500 people. Did you know that? 
Did you know that he just didn't come out of the tomb and, and, and a few of the ladies saw him and a few of the disciples saw him and then he went to heaven? No, Scripture confirms for us that, that it was witness. Notice this in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8. And, and I want you to notice how many times the word seen is in this passage. S-E-E-N. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. It was witnessed. He was seen. See, the resurrection doesn't happen in darkness. When someone comes to faith in Christ, there will be a witness of their transformation. See, God doesn't just save us from our sins. We're not just buried with him in death, but we're raised to newness of life in him. We are, we are resurrected from the dead along with him. So whenever you come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you don't stay dead. But you come to life. And here's the important thing, that people will see you. When I was uh, first got saved and I was coming to Christ and Tandy and I were starting to live for the Lord. And this was years ago. I had a friend of mine call me one day and it was a guy that I used to run around and, and do things with that I was not, I'm not proud of. I'm not going to repeat in this room, but we did some things I wasn't proud of. And he called me one day, and he was like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm doing good. And he started wanting to reminisce and rehearse our past. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's me. I said, but that's not me anymore. And this was his exact phrase to me. He said, you didn't, you didn't go and become one of those Jesus boys, did you? And I said, well... Yes, yes, I did. You see, what, what, he, what he was looking at, what he was hoping to see was dead Scott. But what he saw was Scott that had been resurrected with Jesus. Because your life, you know, when the resurrection of Jesus, you'll witness it. You'll see the transformation in people's lives. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes it's a process that people walk through. But they don't stay dead. When Lazarus came out of the tomb, they didn't say, let him stay wrapped up. Let him continue living life like he looks dead. No, they said, take the death clothes off of him. Come on, I love that song we were singing today. I'm coming out of my grave clothes. Because we're living in resurrected yeah. life. Yeah. So significant that we understand that as believers today. The second thing that, that Paul recognized is that if there's no resurrection, if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then our faith is futile. Yeah. And, and on top of that, he makes this statement, and we are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. And I don't disagree. Look at this, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. <clears throat> But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more, we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. Man, I read that passage a lot to remind myself of the significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it's one thing that he died on the cross, right? And he paid the penalty for our sins and that he was buried in the grave that we might identify with him. But we would still be dead in sins if he was not resurrected from the grave to eternal life. Our faith doesn't stop at the cross, 
You gotta, faith's got to carry you all the way through the resurrection. It's only then do you truly have a clear picture of the gospel. Yes, do I believe he died on the cross for my sins? Absolutely. Did he shed his perfect blood that I might be saved? Yes, he did. Was he buried in a borrowed man's tomb? Yes, he was. Did he come out of the grave to give me eternal life? Yes. Emphatically, yes. Because that's how we're saved. As we believe that and understand that. Jesus is also, the resurrection is important because Jesus was raised from the dead. This is so important for everyone in this room. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we can have faith that we too one day will experience the power of resurrection. It's a kingdom reality. Because he was raised, I can trust I'm going to be raised. Because he came out of the grave, I know that I will not be, be banished into the grave forever. Because of his resurrection, I have hope. I have hope. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 23, it says, So Jesus, so you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, Everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. Now, that's a good word, isn't it? But read the next line. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. Listen, you can't hope to be raised if you don't believe that he was first raised. That's where your hope is. You can't say, I don't know if Jesus was resurrected. You are not saved. Because you cannot be resurrected into newness of life if he first wasn't resurrected from the dead. We have to put our faith in the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is not a fairy tale. It's not wishful thinking. You see, Paul argues that without the resurrection, why would he, why would Pastor Chris, why would I myself, still risk our lives to proclaim the gospel if there is no resurrection. You see, 1 Corinthians 15, 30 through 32 says this. And why should we risk our lives hour by hour? For I swear, dear brothers and sisters, that I face death daily. Now, I praise God that is not my testimony. (laughs) But it was his. For this is as certain as my pride in what Christ Jesus our Lord has done in you. And what value was there in fighting wild beasts, those people of Ephesus, if there will be no resurrection from the dead? He said, why would I risk my life day after day? Why would I put myself in the lion's den with people who hate me and hate God? Why would I do that every single day if in my heart I believed that there is no resurrection? You know, the fact that 2,000 years since Jesus died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed is evidence of the resurrection. It's evidence of the resurrection. You say, how is it evidence? Because, Because preacher after preacher, minister after minister, prophet after prophet, apostle after apostle has declared it because they know there was a resurrection. And that there's one to come. We know this. So why, why would anyone want us to be silent about the resurrection? Why? And here's the funny thing. It was the religious people that wanted, wanted them to shut up. It was. It was the priest. It was the, the religious folks. You see, what happens is when you take, when you take faith and you boil it down to just a a, uh, a uh, to just rules and regulations to follow, right? When you boil it all down, you you don't. It doesn't take faith anymore to believe. It's just about doing right and doing wrong. It doesn't even take faith because you don't have to believe in a resurrection if you boil it down to just right and wrong rules to follow. What happens is that when Jesus showed up. He upset the apple cart, didn't he? That's what I loved about when Jesus went into the temple, 
right? You remember that story? Right before, and this is like right before his crucifixion, he went into the temple, and he went into the temple because he knew this. You know, you ever, I shared this last week in a message, and I still got 12 minutes, so we're good. The, uh, I was talking about the um, triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and everybody was shouting and praising, right? They were like, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were waving palm branches. They were taking off their jackets. They were laying it down. They were ushering in the coming king and, and all of those things. And there was all this rejoicing. But if you look at Jesus, it said Jesus was weeping. He, he, wasn't, yeah, he, wasn't, he wasn't rejoicing because he knew what he was going to find when he got to the temple. Here's the issue. They were rejoicing because they thought he was going to come in and that he was going to hang a left to the governor's palace. That he was going to come in and he was going to set up his kingship and he was going to deliver them out of the oppression of Rome. That he was going to put Pilate in his place and he was going to set up his earthly kingdom and this was all about to go down and they are shouting, they are praising, they are ready and instead of going left to the, the governor's palace, he hung a right and went to the temple where the religious people were. And he wept because he said, I know, I already know what I'm going to find when I get there. And he wept as he went in, and his weeping turned to righteous anger. And he began to turn over the tables, and he began to rush, run out the money changers, and he, and he began to run out those that were, that were merchants and they were selling. And you know, most of us read that passage, and what do we, we rejoice. We're like, go Jesus. Come on, get them out of the temple. That, they don't need, they, all those heathens don't need to be there. Can I tell you, they weren't heathens. I said this last week. I said, them is us. I said, it's not good English, but it's good preaching. Them is us. It was the religious folks that were in the temple. It was the Jews that were in the temple. He said, there was no, there was no Gentiles allowed in the out. They weren't allowed there. to work. So these were Jewish people that were there, and they were doing all of these things. And Jesus said, my house is supposed to be called a house of prayer. You've made it into a den of thieves. And he, up, he uprooted everything there. He, he, we were, they were rejoicing, thinking about their deliverance. He was weeping over the conditions of their hearts. They, they, they were praising God with their lips, but their hearts were far from him. And so these religious folks, listen, they had boiled re their religion down to a set of rules of do's and don'ts. And Jesus said, no, no, you're missing it. It's not about, a it's not about do's and don'ts. It's about resurrection life. It's about the fact that you died in your sins and that you were buried with me. But, but on the third day, I came out to give you hope and a future and a plan. Resurrection is different. That's what sets us apart. That is the greatest kingdom reality that we can hold on to. Jesus was a great teacher. Amen. I love that. Jesus was a great prophet. Amen. He was a great rabbi, a great teacher. <laughs> All those things are good. But he is our resurrected Lord. That's the reality that sets us apart. That's the one that defines us. I'm asking the worship team to come. See, I promised you. Just because I asked them to come doesn't mean I'm done preaching yet. You probably have learned that from your pastor already. That just because he invites them to come. But I will make you a promise. Because here's the thing. When it comes, when we come into the word of, the word of God does not return void, right? But it accomplishes everything he wills and desires it to. And I believe this everywhere that I go, that, and I know that Pastor Chris believes this too, that we preach for a response. Not a response to how great our message is. You're responding to the word of God that is going forth and is being seated in your heart right now. God expects a response. You know, this morning we had a wonderful message in tongues and interpretation. Right? And, and, and a message in tongues are powerful things because God is trying to get our attention and He's speaking to us. But if there's no interpretation, then we're not edified as a body. There was an interpretation that came, 
okay? And, because, and the reason that God allowed, wanted the interpretation to become because he did not want that word to return void. He wanted it to edify the body, to encourage the body. So there's an interpretation of that word that then strengthened us. And God was telling us, repeated, trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in me with your whole heart. Do you remember the word? Don't for, when, when there's a message in tongues, it's not for you to, to shut down and just, and, and, and just move past it and say, well, let's get to worship now or let's get to the word. If, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit in operation that God is trying to instruct you. He's trying to speak to your heart. He wants you to respond. When I pastored, oftentimes I would do an altar call right then. I figured if God is speaking to us through a spiritual gift that perhaps maybe we need to stop and let somebody respond to that word. I believe the same is true when we're preaching. Is that God has laid a burden of his word on our heart to release into the congregation for their edification and their strength with the intention that when that word is seated, that they will not just put it on the bookshelf, but they will respond to what the Spirit of God is speaking to the church. So my question this, for you this morning is, have you been listening? Not to me, but have you been listening to the Holy Spirit? I, I believe today that one of the things that, that I thought saw about this message is that there are a lot of us who are living in the shadow of the cross, but we're not living in the light of the resurrection. You see, we've, 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 we've come to the altar and we've confessed our sins. And can I tell you, if you've confessed your sins to God, God has forgiven you. He did. He's not making you jump through hoops. He's just looking for authenticity, for you to come and confess your sins. And that's, that's the beginning step, right? We believe in our hearts and we come, we confess our sins unto God. And we identify with his death and his burial and what he did. But then many times what we do is we get up and that's how we live our life, the rest of our life. We just live, we live like Lazarus coming out of the tomb, wrapped in grave clothes. And sometimes we'll straighten our grave clothes up. Does that look all right, babe? No, straighten up that, that, that bandage over there. You need to straighten up this one, right? We try to, we, can you wash a little bit of that blood off? I got a little blood on, on my grave. Can you wash that off? I don't want to look like a complete idiot when I go out into public. It, it, can I tell you that if you're walking around wearing grave clothes, you already look funny because <laughs> you're carrying with you the stench of death with you wherever you go. That's why Jesus said, what sets me apart isn't, isn't that you needed that. You needed to, 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 for him to die on the cross. You needed to accept what he did. But when Jesus came out of the tomb, guess the, let me tell you the difference between Lazarus and Jesus. Both men came out of the tomb, right? Lazarus came out wearing grave clothes. Jesus did not. Jesus left his grave clothes in the tomb because he came out to resurrection life. What I'm believing today, in just a moment, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. And if you come, great. If you don't, that's between you and Jesus. But I believe some of you are, are, are born again. With all my heart, I believe it. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're here today. You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've never repented of your sins and asked him to forgive you. And if you haven't, we want to invite you to come in just a moment. But I believe probably most of you in this room, you're born again and you've made that confession of faith. But I wonder if you're still, you're living, you're living saved, but you're living like Lazarus. You're not really living in resurrection life. You've not really embraced the newness of life that Jesus secured for you when he came out of the tomb. And we want to pray for you today. We want to pray. This is what our prayer is going to be. God, loose them from the grave clothes. 